Well, welcome everyone. Welcome to Dumbarton Fairport's VW video worship. And thank you, Don, for being here at our six to 10 feet apart, um, and for Lee as well. So welcome everyone. And before we begin, I just have a couple of things to offer to you. And the first is that we are taping, as you can see, in the sanctuary of Dumbarton Fairport. But it may be that we have to shift and go to another location like my home. And if that's the case, we will figure things out. And if there's some other thing that we need to do, we'll figure it out as we go along. But for today, today we are here in our sanctuary. The other thing to say to you is you see these, these wall dividers, uh, room dividers behind me. The hope was to ask the kids and adults to draw us some pictures, email them to us, and we will post them here for each worship service so that we're not so lonely here without of our church family. And artwork and pictures would be lovely. If that can't happen here in the sanctuary, still email them and I'll access them. And if we are somewhere else taping, I'll just put them up there anyway. So for now, let's take a deep breath as I light the Christ candle, a symbol of Christ's presence with us this day and always. Let us join together with our territorial acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the Creator entrusted the land on which we gather to First Nations peoples of the Iroquois, Ojibwe, Huron-Wenda, and Anishinaabe. We strive to decolonize our hearts, minds, and spaces to make right with all our relations. May it be so. So let us quiet our thoughts and let us open our hearts to God beyond us, around us, among us, with and within us too. Let us just hold silence for a moment. Conversations, consolation, compassion, a situation without hope? Absolutely not. The world is about to turn. The world is about to be born again. God calls to us and gathers us together from beyond the here and now. God calls us into and from the future. And the redeeming love of God reaches into and touches the depths of our hearts and our souls and summons us as the whole world into a wholeness again. Let us journey through the shadows towards that light. Let us do so. In the shadows of Lent or in the absolute beauty of Easter's dawn, in our times of doubt, our times of grief, or when life is full and joyous and our cups overflow, 
In all times we give thanks to God, the source of life, the source of love. Jesus Christ, love incarnate, and the Holy Spirit loves power. There is no better thing to do and no better place to be right now than joining our hearts and our minds and our souls together by that spirit of love amongst us, within us, by us forever. Let us sing of this day. Loving God, hear our call to you in our prayers, in our songs. And God, renew our spirits with life. Redeeming God, call us back to you. Help us to begin again on a new road in life. And Spirit of God, breathe on us, breathe in us new life. In Christ and with the Christ we pray. Amen. Sometimes things happen in life that leave us feeling so sad or filled with pain or grief. And sometimes we just feel we can't see a way out. Some feel that way now, but it is not true. The stories of the faithful, the stories we tell each other of our own lives through the years, remind us always that there is hope and there are new beginnings and new life happens. We need not sit in the dark of despair. Let us pray. Ever-present God, from the dark places of our lives where we find ourselves giving up or without hope or filled with doubts, we pray for forgiveness and assurance and hope to touch our hearts, for forgiveness, assurance, and hope spread with love, even over where fear and doubt have spread first. May we we trust trust in the the words of the faithful. faithful. May May we we anchor anchor ourselves ourselves in hope. hope. May we open ourselves to possibilities we've never imagined. May we faithfully step out of the dark as you call us to new life. With and within the Christ, we pray. Amen. God in Christ offers forgiveness. God in Christ heals our hurts and shows us the way to forgive, to be assured, and to love with hope always. And by working in and with and through us, that spirit of love makes all things new. That spirit couches our road ahead and gives us truth, grace, and peace. Peace to your hearts, everyone. Amen.
Well, this is normally our children's time or for those who feel like a kid inside and uh, with all these lovely friends here I feel like a kid inside and so we begin with God is good all the time all the time God is good God is good and we have new friends here today we have a sleeping bear who just doesn't really want to attend to the music I think he's just asleep on the hymn book many of us might like to be asleep too it's early and we also have a monkey holding on to a tiger and a frog sort thing. I think it's a frog. And we have a, another bear and we have a lion and another bear. So we've got extra visitors and you do too, right? Yes. Ella's Snoopy. Came. Ella, Ella, ah. Ella loan, loaned us her Snoopy. Ella's Snoopy. Well, welcome to Snoopy. So we have friends and I hope you have your friends with you too for this time together. Now, we do tend to always remember to go into our basket to see what we have for purple things this week. And what I have is yet another car rag, because we like to keep our cars clean. Purple car rag. And look what I found in my office at home. He's um, a rabbit, kind of. A rabbit clown with purple pom-poms. So we will add him to here instead of the basket, if he will stand up. I have, as we get close to Easter, a beautiful purple egg that someone gave me a few years ago. So we will add this in here. And it got a little mangled coming in today, but it is indeed a purple butterfly, a sign of new life always. So we will have our basket just right here with our purple things that are our offerings to one another, things we give up for Lent that symbolize giving up anger and resentment or prejudice or bullying, all those things we are going to let go, that is what these symbolize. Now, I do have the bag for the beads, but we're not going to do that just yet. I thought I would bring to you some of my other fun things that I like. And don't want to forget anything here when it comes to the beads, beads or stones. But... In the scripture stories, there are a lot of stories that talk about God's love being like, like a water that flows across the earth. So I have some water here. And this is going to be fun because I love playing with water and I love puddles and jumping in puddles and <laughs> shooting it up. And I, I love bubbles, lots and lots of bubbles. I didn't bring bubbles. I just have water. So we talk about the Holy Spirit being like water that flows and goes all around our earth. That isn't that great. I love it. And now, as I've talked to many and said, for me, God is like a daisy. When I can see daisies, I think of God's presence all around the earth, like even a napkin, right? 
So how would I understand Jesus? Are you ready? Jesus is a sponge, a sponge that is cut. It's a red sponge, pinkish, and it is just like a, a heart shape. So for me, Jesus is like the love holder, the, the, the grabs God's spirit of love and holds it all and fills just so much to overflowing. And that that love goes through Jesus out into, I'm gonna put it into the bucket now, into the world. And look, the sponge just gets so full and the love just pours out all through the world. And you know who we are? We're this little hard sponge. And there's a bunch of hard sponges. And sometimes that's just because we're so preoccupied and, and things happening to us that we need that love that Jesus can, can help spread throughout the world and that he taught us about. And when we do, this is the fun part, then I've got lots of water here and lots of sponges. And the Holy Spirit of love that flows through the world and through and by Jesus flows through all of us too. And then we're all nice and soft. And we are filled with love ourselves to share around the world. And that's how the world will change, is by the power of the Spirit of love. And there you go. God is a daisy. Jesus is a sponge. The Holy Spirit is water, at least in my world. And the final thing for us today for the kids is this last bag, the last bag before Palm Sunday. We go back and we look, there was red at the bottom. Red represented those who were poor in spirit and that they will be assured of, of God's presence. And then we had blue for those who mourn or who grieve, that they will be comforted by that spirit that's poured out through the world. Green is for those who are gentle and kind and they will know gentleness and kindness in return. The orange here are for those who will stand up for, for justice, stand up for others, and they will be supported. The yellow is for mercy, for those who know how to forgive and to let go and to move on, and they will be forgiven and loved and held in return. Those little round ones, those indigo colored, they were those to represent those who follow God, because the more we follow God, the more we come to know God. The pink ones for last week, the pink was for those who work for peace and for calm. Because working for peace and calm, we can experience peace and calm ourselves by the peacemaker, the prince of peace. And today we have, these are my favorite ones actually. Today we have, they're sort of white, they are clear, they are transparent. And they are the last ones. And they go to overflowing too. And they are absolutely beautiful. There we go. And the white, the white is for those who have faith and have courage and are willing to just stand up there with their faith and courage and know that the world is about to turn and the world will be well. And they work for it. And these represent then all the people that Jesus offered in the blessings that those who will be blessed and turned by God's love and the Holy Spirit of life. So there we go. So at this point, I think we will just put our hands together and repeat after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, help me to be honest. Help me to be honest. Help me to be kind. Help me to be kind. Help me to be love. Help me to be love. Amen. Amen. And hear us as we pray as Jesus taught the first disciples to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel of John. It's chapter 11, and the actual story goes from verse 1 to 45. So I'm going to invite you to read 1 to 45 on your own at home. We will be hearing, though, verses 1 to 6, 17, and 30 to 44, mostly just to get the story. This Gospel writer, John, who I've told you I've come to really like over the last 10, 15 years or so. I like him because of his mysticism, his symbolism, and he's so creative with his words. And he tells us that Jesus made his message known through signs, through doing things, through action, like changing water to wine. John's stories of Jesus tell us Jesus was life and love incarnate, and he brought life to all he encountered by the love he showed every human contact up to the point of raising Lazarus, including offering others, offering persons, a fuller or healed, more wholesome, more joyful life. Not everyone wanted to listen to Jesus, but this is John's story telling us to listen. And I'd like to say thanks to Donna Lee for offering our reading for us today. Our scripture passage this morning is from John chapter 11, verses 1 to 6, 17, and 30 to 44. Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary, and her sister Martha. Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. Her brother Lazarus was ill. So the sister sent a message to Jesus, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, this illness does not lead to death. Rather, it is for God's glory, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Accordingly, though Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, after having heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought that she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed you would see the glory of God. So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Hear what the Spirit is saying to us this day. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Donna Lee, for offering that, for sending it in, and it's great to have that happen that way. So may God's blessing be added to the hearing of these words. Last night, a few of us had some fun on Facebook. I asked you to guess the movie that I was watching. I took pictures of the TV screen and posted on Facebook. Several of you were guessing, either by text or on Facebook, 
and the winner was Krista Shepard. She won that the movie was Jason and the Argonauts. But then I asked, what did the movie have to do with the scriptures for Sunday? And the winner was first Ted Miller and second Jan Hannon. But actually it's a huge stretch. Jason and the Argonauts has very little to do with Fifth Lent. But in my head, I did make a connection. See, I used to watch this movie at home as a kid, and whenever it came to the place where the bones that were all coming up out of the ground, do you remember that scene? The bones come up out of the ground, and they form in their skeletons, and then they clink and clank, and they, they create this little army, and then they fight Jason, all these skeleton people. Well, that's very different than Ezekiel's story. Ezekiel is totally about the whole nation coming to life again. But in this case, those bones that became skeletons that fought Jason, well, I think they just didn't pick, on, pick up life from the waters of the earth as they were born again. They stayed hard and dry, and, and they were just lifeless, except for their army behavior. When I read the Ezekiel story, which is another one of the scriptures for this week, I think about the bones, the bones coming together. I think about Jason and the Argonauts, which does not really connect. And then I think about the song, them bones, them bones, them dry bones. And maybe parents and grandparents should teach that to their kids today. But today's story is about Lazarus, as you've heard. Nothing to do with Jason. Well, except maybe if you put some thought into the golden fleece, as in animals, as in lambs, and the golden fleece saves lives without giving away the end of the movie. Lazarus is not about bones. Lazarus is not about zombies either. John's story of Lazarus is about new life, and that new life is possible in this life and at the end of life too. This is a two-for-one message brought to you by John, our mystical, symbolic, and metaphorical gospel writer. Lazarus, as you heard, he was sick, he died. And Jesus, by the Spirit, called him to new life, a fresh start, a new beginning. But the truth is, in the end, he's going to die. He's going to die again. But that's when he will come into eternal life, into the eternal presence of love, which is God. So far this Lent, John has told us the stories of Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, the blind man, and today Lazarus. And each story tells us of a spiritual journey from darkness to light, from thirst to being quenched, from blindness to sight, from being entombed to being set free. And John is really going out of his way, really trying hard to tell us something over and over again. And that is about the hope and the promise of God that new life is possible all the time, no matter what the darkness is. These stories are layered with incredibly rich meaning and depth that we're invited to cut into or bite into and I think it's like a chocolate fudge layer cake. That's what this scripture is. And at the center of this chocolate fudge layer cake is, like Lazarus's story, a little nugget of really amazing chocolate that is the wisdom or the manna of God feeding us and letting us know that in order to be filled, in order to be changed and know new life, we have to empty ourselves from who we were and who we are and to get rid of our grief and our anger our feelings of pain or doubt, maybe even a belief inside us that God's let us down or not there when we've needed God. But when we've emptied ourselves, well, then we're hungry. We're hungry to discover that God is with us, that God is in the dark with us, and the Spirit is with us too. Now back to Mary and Martha. They didn't hold back on their pain, nor on complaining to Jesus that he could have, if he'd been there earlier, he could have done something for Lazarus. They were hurting big time. And we hurt too. And sometimes, like now, we want to just yell at God. And we want to say, God, what the heck are you doing? Or where are you? And we want to name and we need to name our anger, even when it is for God, we, our belief that God isn't answering our prayers the way we want God to, the way we want our prayers to be answered, where, when, and how. Because God answers prayers in so many mysterious ways. Mary and Martha and Lazarus, we need to know, were a family, and they were close, close friends of Jesus, and they followed all the local customs around death, and now here we are with Lazarus gone. 
But, as with our scriptures, Jesus' involvement would give way to the unusual, and that would be in order, as the story says, in order that all may see the glory of God. The first hint of what was to come occurs when Martha met Jesus. Martha knew that Jesus had the power to save her brother, and she went out of the home, outside of the custom of staying in to mourn. She went out to meet Jesus. And he engaged her in an affirmation of resurrection, both for Lazarus and for all at the end of life. And then next, Mary began a conversation with Jesus in the same way. Then, our, our gospel writer tells us, the message was made available to all. For the sake of the crowd, it was offered with drama and emotion and weeping and sadness and grief. And it culminates in Jesus calling Lazarus out of the tomb. Like, this would make a great movie. I should tell Lee, this would make a great movie. Jesus saves Lazarus from the death he is in. And the Greek word to save also conveys a sense of total restoration, or to restoration and wholeness. Jesus calls Lazarus out saying, Lazarus, come out. And he does. And then Jesus says, unbind him and let him go. And they do. But go where? Have you ever wondered that? What did Lazarus go do? Where was he to go? Did he go buy a new car? Maybe that's what you do when you're brought to new life. You go buy a new car. Maybe he went shopping. Maybe he went out for pizza. Maybe that's what he did. What did he do with this new life? What would you do if it happened to you? Because Jesus didn't say, unbind him and let him go home. No, he wasn't going back. And he didn't say, Mary and Martha, come and get your brother. That didn't happen either. Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. So what exactly was it that Lazarus was to do? And where was he to go? I think that is the vital question for us today. When you have been entombed in a time of despair or a darkness, or a sadness, or maybe an experience of death, or some other very deep personal experience or community tragedy or trauma. A call to new life doesn't lead you back to where you were. It leads you back, it leads you out into a new place of being from which you came. The call to new life invites you out, healing from it, like being born new, changed, and on a new path, and even perhaps to tell others about your journey, what you've experienced, and what you learned from it. If we think of Nicodemus, he walked away with much to think on as the morning drew near. And the Samaritan woman, she went to her village, and she spread the good news as an apostle for Christ. And the blind man suddenly was sight. He faced those who asked who Jesus was, who questioned who Jesus was. So now Lazarus. Where did he go? What did he do? I think the question in this for each and all of us and the whole world right now, when this crisis is over, is we will need to look back and think about the whole experience and ask, what did we learn? Where do we go now? And what do we go do? When we are called out again, when we are called out to a freedom to be human together again, in closeness, hugging each other again, We'll also have to think about how or what it might mean for us to unbind ourselves like Lazarus was, unbind ourselves from the trauma and the tragedy and the fears we are feeling, and learn to let it go so that we might move on in a new way. I think that's what Lazarus had to do, partly. But to do so, it's going to take some truth-telling and courage to name what was, to name why things happened, what happened, and what did we learn from all this? As Christians, as people of faith, we believe that we are not alone. We say that over and over. You and I have said that a few times. We are not alone. We believe there is only one creator who we call God. There's one humanity, and none are better than the other, and none are invulnerable, and all are equally human. And there's one planet that we've been very we've been shown very clearly one planet, one earth, one humanity, and this, this is what we have, beginnings of what we have definitely learned. 
but who will help us to contemplate and reflect on the learnings? I believe that our musicians and our poets are our prophets of today. In the past, in the scriptures, they had prophets who wrote music, who wrote prayers and poetry. They were the prophets of God who spoke God's word in their time. I believe today our musicians and our poets will reflect to us what has happened in their words and with their understandings. I have a very, very dear friend who writes poetry, and he's a musician. And he sent this to me early this morning. This is his understanding, but we can grasp some of this. And he wrote, God grant us, in these moments of quiet, as the global pandemic grinds the gears of commerce, as the air becomes breathable again, and we see with different eyes, let us learn that God is not external. God does not grant us anything but self-awareness, because that is where divinity resides. God is imminent energy, living temporarily in the terrible wonder of the flesh, battling to liberate love into the ragged earth. One thing I've learned over years in ministry in different churches is we all have different understandings of God, but we all come back to understanding that God, in the power of the Spirit and the power of love, does bring us into new life and restoration and wholeness. John's scripture story here about Jesus calling Lazarus out to new life and wholeness does the same thing. And we can trust that we too will be called to new life and wholeness, the whole world, because this is a world event and there is only one world. But the whole world, the whole earth, and all people will be, will be working towards liberating love. Again, the question is back to Lazarus. How will we live it out? How will we live out our new life? What will we do? What will, what will we do in this world on the other side of COVID? How will we be the church? How will we be together in a new way? How will we reach out to our community in a new way? And how will our whole world respond? That's where I think Lazarus had to go and figure out what to do because he was not the same. We're not the same. He went from the cold, brittle dryness of the cave to testing the fresh water of love and the warmth of sunshine and clear skies, as will we. He was not the same, and we won't be the same either. And he saw life through a new lens, and I think we're going to see everything through a new lens too. I think the spirit of new life that Lazarus received from Jesus through his call to life led him to go unbound from that which tethered him to his past, freeing him to reach out, give and love so completely that his whole life became love, love incarnate, as was that of Jesus of Nazareth. The purpose of raising Lazarus was that God through Christ mourns with us in grief and that God through Christ calls us to new life out of the darkness we know and the call of God even reaches beyond the grave. We sing of the spirit of gentleness, we sing for the Spirit to open our hearts. Now in our homes, without freedom, we are bound and we wait the call to come out, to be made new and live new with all of humanity and all of creation. As we approach this last week before Palm Sunday and then Passion or Holy Week, may we each consider these final steps of Lent and the end steps of the journey into ourselves and into our relationships with each other and with God and with all of creation. And let us ask ourselves, what have we learned? What have we learned about being human, about being divinely held and moved, and what's left undone? From what tomb is God in Christ calling us? From what blindness is God in Christ inviting us to see new again? From what parchment of our souls is God in Christ offering us the living and spiritual waters of new life? This is the end of the journey of Lent. And hopefully, as we move through to the other side of Lent, through Easter, through the COVID crisis too, whatever happens and whenever it happens and unfolds, may it be that we can find ourselves not or no longer bound to the ways in which we have been living. And may we let go then of our selfishness and our greed and our divisiveness, our prejudice, our racism, our systemic injustices, and all those things that lead us to even war. 
May we see the incarnational love of God that is poured out to us, giving us comfort and strength and hope. And may we understand that the calls that are being made that started yesterday with very human, caring, tender calls, voices to all of us that are going to be happening, flowing through this church over the weeks ahead. These calls are being made by our pastoral care ministry. They are coordinated by Diane and Jan, and they're being made with Brenda and Kimberly and Heather and Gail and me and Anne behind the scenes. These calls are our words, but they are the love of God that is flowing to us and through us like water, but the water is the spirit of love. By the Spirit, let us all open our hearts. Let us be ready to answer the call to come out with new understanding, new life, new love, new insight, new chocolate nuggets of wisdom. May we be unbound from the past that we were. May we let go of the past. May we be brought to wholeness with hope for the future. May we know the great trinity of God and all of humanity and all of creation are held together by a spirit of love. And may we trust that there always is another Easter. Whenever it happens, there will be another Easter. Thanks be to God. Amen. God, is in, it is in the depths of life that we find you, and it is in the darkest of moments, and in the coldest of caves, at the heart of this moment even, when we are gathered together with you, we find you. In this time of challenge and worry and fear, God, we pray you will help us to feel you and find you at the center of our souls, like deep in the earth and its eternal stirrings. Holy healer, you are the ground of all being, found even in the ragged earth. God, you're the source of life and love, the wellspring of time, the womb of the earth itself, and the seed force for stars. And so it is, God, with trust and faith that we hear your word, and we bring to you our prayers for each other and the whole world. 
And we wait assured that you hear us and you work in with and through us and together we answer these prayers. God, we give thanks for those who long ago founded this church here, the seeds of this church family. They had a vision and a dream for us today and they had that long ago and we are here. Like those generations through the years who lived through struggles of their own God, like depression and the world wars and cultural revolutions, God, they were held together by faith and hope and love, and we, like them, face our own challenges, but we live into them with faith, hope, and love, just as they did in the past. And God, we hold on to the promise to make it through together with our own vision and our own dream for the future here. Holy One, like the psalmist, we pray for those whose hope is lost, who feel dried up and cut off from you. By your grace, we pray you will roll back the stones and the graves of their hearts, their minds and souls, and bring them back to the land of the living, of joy and hope and love. God, we pray for those who are oppressed and held captive by the power of death in the many ways that this occurs. We pray they will be released from their chains, unbound from their hurts, from their previous ways, and that they will let go, that we will all let go. <clears throat> Excuse me that we will all let go of what was and be open to what may be. Holy One, we pray for those who weep, who are lost, who are lifeless in fear and regret. We pray that you will grant them the peace of your presence and show them what your love can do. We pray for those who are sick or their loved ones are sick, and we, we hope for the cures, we hope for a vaccine, we hope for healing. Separated but together, we know new life can happen and will happen. God, we pray for all who serve to keep us safe and well, with peace among us even as we stay home and stay apart. We pray for our government leaders and all who work with them, for those who transport food and medicines and equipment, for those who stock the shelves in our food stores and work as cashiers. God, we pray for police and fire services and all hospital staff, the workers, the professionals, the researchers, God, we pray for all in essential services. We pray for families and friends and neighbors and strangers. And God, we, as we pray, we also give thanks for your wisdom that comes as a manna from heaven to feed us, to help us and guide us through this. We pray for those who are dying, the light of life fading in their eyes. We pray you will help them to know your call into eternal life, into your love forever. And we pray you will be with their loved ones who sit by their sides. May they grieve wholly, fully, and honestly, and may they heal, and may they come to know peace. Hear us now, God, as we offer to you our prayers for our churches, for ourselves, for this church family here at Dunbarton Fairport. And God, our most personal prayers that come from the depths of our own hearts. Healing God, may your love be at home in us, that we go out in peace. God, may the justice of the Christ be at home in us, that we go out in hope, a living hope. God, may the wildness of your spirit be poured into us and be at home in us, that we go out with compassion flowing and caring flowing from us. May we go out with wonder and joy, God, with willingness in our hearts that your love might be made new incarnate in us that the mind that was in christ might be the new mind in us and that the compassion of your spirit will be the new spirit in us we pray these things together amen this is the time we normally have our offering as you know a letter has gone out to share with you how we proceed how we continue to be a vital and viable church in these changing times so i offer you this invitation as God is always faithful, let us also be faithful to God and to those who came before us here and to each other and to those of whom we hold in a vision and a dream for the future who will be here. Let us hold them in our thoughts as we bring forward our offerings for the continued life of Dunbarton Fairport now 
And for when we come out of the cave and into the new life of Easter, no matter what day that is, but also forevermore. Amen. Gracious God, with this offering here gathered, and in the many ways it is brought to us, and for those that are offering their offering through par, and the work of our hands through the week, we present also ourselves. We present all that we have been, and all that we are, and all that we shall become, and our resolve, each of us and all of us, to walk in your way. Accept us, God, and our offering. Bless us and our offerings. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So 
to thank you all for being with us during this time of worship together in a new way together. I want to thank Don for all your work and all of our emails late at night and <laughs> with others. Also Linda and Donna Lee for reading the scripture today, for Pam and for Lee and the poet that sent in his, his poem was Austin. So thank you all for making this day a special day of hope. And I found, as I was in my office, a piece of paper. It's a mess in there. It's a poem. It's a prayer. I think it was from a Celtic Christian book. But I leave you with these words. The ages, ageless mountains are full of God's glory. The vast seas swell with God's might. The shining skies expand beyond our imagining. So we pause to delight in all that is and to give thanks and to learn we listen to learn of the mountain glory within us, of the sea force in our veins, of love's shining infinity deep within our souls. Grant us the grace, God, to serve this inner universe of soul among us. Grant us the faith, God, to know that out of the darkness new life comes soon. So we wait in wonder and in awe, but we wait with hope and faith and we wait in love. Amen. love of God surround you and the peace of Christ dwell deep within you and that power of the Holy Spirit, the comfort and the compassion flow to you and flow through you this day and always. Amen.